Welcome to Future Talk. On today's program, we're going to talk about transforming human perception. My guest is Cara Platoni, who teaches journalism at the UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism and who has written a new book called We Have the Technology, How Biohackers, Foodies, Physicians, and Scientists are Transforming Human Perception One Sense at a Time. We'll be discussing topics ranging from new methods of fixing sensory impairments to biohackers who implant electronic devices in their bodies that communicate directly with the central nervous system to give them totally new sensory experiences. We'll talk about reality, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality and the nature of perception itself. Cara, great to have you on the program today. Thanks for having me. Cara, what inspired you to write this book? Well, I've been a, a science reporter here in the Bay Area for almost 20 years now, which is, it comes as a surprise to me all of the time. And uh, as I started thinking about writing a book, I thought, what are people really interested in? What are people really talking about? Well, it turns out the Bay Area is a great place for people who are studying the brain, and it is a great place for gadgets. And I thought, what kind of brings this together? The idea of technologies that affect the brain. So there I had it. And you have a copy of the book with you. Maybe you could hold it up so we can see what it looks like. So here it is. It's the one so with the giant the head. <laughs> we have the technology. Now, there are a lot of very interesting things in the book. And one of the things that struck me the most was these biohackers implanting electronic devices in their bodies in order to have new sensory experience. What kind of experiences are these people looking for? Well, I, I got to spend some time with a group called Grindhouse Wetware. They're based out of uh, Pennsylvania. And um, they're looking to kind of expand their sensory world. They're a little bit frustrated with, with what the human body can do. So some biohackers are trying to give themselves an electromagnetic sense. They think that's something that other animals have, people don't, so they're trying to do it. When I met Tim Cannon and the other guys at Grindhouse, they had just implanted Tim with this device called Circadia. And it was an implant that was in his arm. It was about the size of a deck of cards, and what it did was it took his temperature and it ported that information to his phone, his cell phone, so he could look at it and see what his temperature was. I think we actually have a slide of that Circadia device. Yeah. Can we see that slide, please, with the Circadia device? Yeah. So there it is. That's the kind of the floor model. That's what they put in Tim's arm. You can see it's encased in silicone. It has this charging coil, and it actually lights up when you hold the charging coil up to it. It flashes red and green. So they had just built that when I was there. And they had gotten started on a new project that they called North Star. And the idea of North Star was to be a compass, an in-hand compass. Now we have a picture of that as well. Can we see the next slide, which is a picture of the North Star device? So there it is, not very large. It's about the size of a quarter. So that's what it looks like outside of the body. And their idea for this was, well, they thought, OK, lots of other animals have this electromagnetic sense of direction. Lots of migratory animals do. Uh, sea turtles, some kinds of fish, some kinds of birds. And they thought, wouldn't it be cool if you could tell which direction you were going? So their idea for North Star was this little device would go in the back of your hand, and it would light up when you were facing north. Now, the obvious question is, why would that be better than wearing a compass on your wrist? Right, or what, you know, taking your temperature with a regular thermometer, or uh, other biohackers have put RFID chips in their bodies. A lot of people get them right here in their hand. RFID chip is kind of like the same thing you have on your bridge toll pass, maybe on your card to get in your office. Some people chip their pets, so if the pet gets lost, they can be identified. It almost sounds like there's a desire just to implant things in your body to expand yourself somehow. Yeah, sort of. And, and when I would ask people, I'd say, why does it have to be in you? Why can't it be on a card? Or, you know, why can't you carry it in your hand? They would say, because it enlarges what my body can do. It changes my capability. It changes my sense of self. And if I had, to, if I lost it, if I had to get rid of it, I would feel bereft. I would really feel like I lost a sense. We actually have some slides showing the simplant going into somebody's uh, hand. Can we see that next slide? Okay, yeah. so that looks like a bit of a bloody mess there, but it looks like the device is already under the skin and somebody is suturing it. It's got a thread there. So and that's in North Star version one. They call this the light version. They were just doing these implants just around Thanksgiving at the end of last year. And that version doesn't have a compass element in it yet. It just lights up. It's kind of their demo version. So they're perfecting the technology of getting it in there? Yeah, well, and kind of trying to figure out, can we keep charging it? How small can we make it? You notice it's a lot smaller than the previous implant, right? right? All of these kinds of technology, 
things that they have to test to make sure people can wear them, that they're not going to get an infection, it's not going to breach, you know, crack open, and some kind of chemical leach So just the technology of getting the implant in is a major thing. Can we see the next slide, please, further along in the sequence? So now it's in. It looks like they're just pulling the bandage off now. Yeah, this is just somebody demonstrating what it looks like when it's lighting up. So it does light up. It doesn't, it doesn't light up when you face north at this point, but it does light up. And you can definitely see it through the skin. It's, very, it's a very obvious implant. And the skin is very translucent. Yeah. Let's take a look at the next slide. It's in the same vein. Uh, three people all yeah. have it in. Yeah. Yeah, and so one of, some of the guys that I were, uh, were talking to were saying the point of this is to make other people look, to look obviously modified so that people look at you and go, oh my gosh, the cyborg future is here. But uh, a lot of people who have smaller implants, some of the ones that are just a magnet or an RFID chip, you wouldn't know. You would never know if somebody was wearing it. One guy referred to himself as a stealth cyborg. He says, this is something that's just kind of personal to me. Well, there are very practical kinds of implants that people already have, like pacemakers, for sure. example. Hip implants. Uh, some people have, you know, dental implants. Uh, lots of people have been wearing cochlear implant to help them hear. This is a device that's been around since the mid '80s. Can we see the next slide, please? I think we have at least. Okay, this is the last slide in the mm -hmm. series. That shows what it looks like when it's not lit up. Yeah, uh, it's, it's still not that subtle, right? <laughs> right? Can you turn it off? Can you make it light when you want it to? Or? I, you know, I don't know about the North Star. This version, I don't know. Now, what's the ultimate goal? Is the goal actually for these devices to expand your senses somehow to tap into your nervous system? Yeah, this is what, so now these devices don't tap into anyone's nervous system. They, they're kind of standalone devices. But what a lot of biohackers uh, that I talk to, that's what they're after. I kind of think of them as almost this generation's psychonauts. They're interested in expanding their minds, except instead of doing it with drugs the way the psychonauts of the 60s did, they're doing it with technology. And they're saying, look, there are all of these interesting experiences, a person, uh, well, uh, there are all these interesting experiences that we could have, but we can't because of the limitations of the human body. And how do we know we could have them? Well, other animals do. So this is sort of a subculture in a way. Like, are these real doctors, you know, cutting them? And, uh... So the biohackers are, the, they're building their own devices and they're getting them implanted by professional piercers and body modification artists. So not doctors. I think if you went to your doctor and said, I want a North Star, the doctor would say, well, it's not a medical necessity. It's, your insurance is not going to cover it. No, thank you, right? But there are a lot of people who work kind of in the tattoo, body modeling, piercing world who know how to do this. So... Uh, and the biohackers are kind of driven, I think, by curiosity, right? They say, look, sharks can sense electricity. Honeybees can see ultraviolet. There are snakes who can sense the infrared. Uh, there are animals who can use their hearing for sonar, biosonar. Why can't we do that? Now, in your book, you mentioned the concept of transhumanism in which people will try to develop themselves into something more than human beings by mm -hmm. enhancing them in various ways. Is this along that vein, people are trying to use technology to make themselves above mere humanity? I think some of the people that I met in my book might identify as transhumanists. Oh, it's very interesting. Uh, I tried to interview a mix of people. I'm a reporter. I'm not a, a scientist. I'm not a psychologist. So my goal was go out and meet lots of people who are working at the cutting edge of, the, of perception. And that meant biohackers for sure. But it also meant, meant medical researchers, it meant military researchers, it meant people working for private companies. I really tried to cover the field. And so there are a lot of people who are working on the idea of human enhancement, but there are also a lot of people who are working on the idea of assisting people with a medical need. And we're going to talk about that in a little while, but mm -hmm. we have a video to show first. Sure. You mentioned virtual reality in the right. book. So we have a video of a virtual reality system, which is therapeutic in nature. Mm -hmm. It's designed to help soldiers get over PTSD, mm -hmm. post-traumatic stress disorder. Let's go ahead and roll that video. War is among the most demanding challenges a human being can experience, even for the best prepared military personnel. Reports say that one in five Iraq and Afghanistan veterans have been diagnosed with some level of post-traumatic stress. But how to help is not always clear. BraveMind is a form of virtual reality exposure therapy that combines video game-based simulations with one of the most widely used evidence-based therapies. 
making use of the University of Southern California Institute for Creative Technologies, expertise in immersive technologies, and emotional storytelling. BraveMind is a treatment option with appeal for today's digital generation. BraveMind gradually recreates trauma-relevant scenarios that clinicians can use to help patients confront and process difficult memories in a safe and supportive environment. More than just sights and sounds, BraveMind uses a virtual reality head-mounted display, directional 3D audio, vibrations, and smells to generate a truly immersive recreation of the event that can be regulated at a pace the patient can handle. We help people to go back to the things that they were traumatized by, help them to confront those things, to face them, to talk about them. By this process of doing this repetitively and over time, what you see is a gradual decline in the anxiety or the fear response. Currently deployed at over 50 sites, including VA hospitals, military hospitals, and university research clinics, this exposure therapy system has been shown to produce a meaningful reduction in post-traumatic stress symptoms during initial trials. We're not erasing memories or anything. They still remember what they've been through. Those memories don't have the same intense, painful, emotional power that they had before treatment. With the success of Brave Mind, ICT researchers began to evaluate what could be done not just to heal, but to help prevent traumatic stress. Enter Strive, stress resilience in virtual environments. The goal of Strive is to teach effective emotional coping skills and better prepare service members prior to deployments to better cope with the stress of combat. Strive simulates these stressors in a safe environment before they are encountered in the field. The system also provides mitigating strategies on how to handle stress and develop skills to cope with challenging events. You've got to get mentally prepared to handle any of these outcomes. So imagine as many scenarios as you can and start thinking about how you'll react to them. Based on the success of both Strive and Brave Mind, ICT researchers are exploring how this technology can be applied to other trauma sufferers. At ICT, the urgency of treating invisible wounds of war has driven the research and development of virtual reality applications for clinicians. These tools are transforming traditional therapies and are becoming increasingly useful for addressing other needs in our society. And that was our video of a virtual reality system designed to help soldiers overcome PTSD. Now, Carrie, you saw the system in person. Yeah. Can you add anything to what we saw in the video? Yeah, sure. So I went to Buckley Air Force Base to watch uh, Dr. Skip Rizzo, who we just saw in the video, work with soldiers who are about to deploy to Afghanistan. And the idea is, can they kind of pre-treat them? Can they put them in stressful situations that they might encounter uh, and then kind of teach them coping mechanisms within the virtual reality experience so that if they experience something that, like that in real life, they'll be more resi resilient to developing PTSD. It's a really interesting idea. It's based on a much older form of therapy called exposure therapy, which used to be just talk therapy. A person would talk to their therapist, and the idea was you talk about the thing that you fear, you imagine the thing you fear, perhaps you even go out and experience the thing that you fear. For example, heights or going in an airplane or being around a snake, right? And that fear dissipates. When you, ex when you are exposed to the thing you're afraid of and nothing bad happens, that fear abates over time. So it looks like it's actually working. They can measure and determine yeah. that soldiers are better off as a result. So with soldiers who, have already, oh, who already have PTSD, when they go through this form of therapy, yes, they on tests, they score lower on the measures of PTSD. Now, what's not known is if you can actually pre-treat people. That's the stage of the trial that Dr. Rizzo is working on right now. And the, the neat thing is virtual reality can really trick the mind into, it, it, into believing that things are real. Our brains haven't been around in a world with screens for that long. So if you see a virtual snake, you act like it's a snake. If you see some, of something that scares you in virtual reality, you really feel it. So that's the idea here, is to create those real feelings of fear and to help people cope with it. And VR, I know we just saw people who were using just the helmets, but VR is really sophisticated today. So if you go into the labs, it's not just vision. They can make the floor shake. They use surround sound, so you have sound coming at you from all over. Dr. Rizzo, in his lab, he uses smells. So they pump the smell of diesel odor, sweat into the room. Sometimes they have the soldiers carry around a prop rifle just to kind of mimic that feeling of what it's like to be walking around on patrol holding a weapon. I was going to ask, is it interactive?
interactive? Can the soldier play a role, or is he just observing? It's a, it's a little bit in between. He has some agency, but it's not completely freeform. Now, in the book, you talk about virtual reality, mm -hmm. and you also mention something called augmented reality. Yeah. In virtual reality, you're immersed in an environment that's entirely computer-generated. What's the difference between that and augmented reality? It's a good question. So augmented reality, some people also call it mixed reality, is this idea that you have a computer that's giving you some additional information, but you can still see and move around normally. So we're talking smart glasses, smart rings, smart watches, even smart fabrics. Uh, these devices that you wear that are giving you an extra layer of information, but you, know, you and I still see each other normally, you can still walk around, drive around in the world, that sort of thing. So you think we're heading toward a world where we don't just rely on our own senses anymore, but we're depending on machines to interpret the world around us? Yeah, you, you could say that, but s some people say, look, humans have always did this. You're wearing your eyeglasses. I forgot mine, but I wear them. You know, a, a lot of us have some kind of machine on our body or some kind of device on our body that helps us out, helps our sensory perception out. Uh, one of the big questions that came up over and over as I was researching this book is, what is a cyborg? And there were some people I met who said, if you're wearing shoes, you're a cyborg, right? You weren't born with those shoes on your feet. They augment what your feet can do. They protect you against the weather. And other people said, no, no, what's happening now with this technology is different because we're wearing it very intimately on the body. It's more powerful than other technologies have been. And it's so subtle that you might not even notice it's having an effect on you. If you're wearing smart glasses that are feeding you information, directions about where to go, how to get to someplace, a list, for example, of restaurants you might want to visit, you might not even be thinking about the fact that the computer is giving you information, but it is. And somebody designed that program. Somebody curated that list of information. And you don't know why they made the decisions to put information in that they did. And you also don't know what they're leaving out. And that's very interesting. That's a very interesting new aspect of this kind of portable technology. Is there any risk we'll become too dependent on this technology and lose the ability to function without it? Yeah, that's a good question. I wonder about this all the time. In fact, I wonder about this all the time with the cell phone, right? Nobody remembers anybody's phone number anymore. Nobody remembers how to get around town and get directions because your phone does it for you. And in fact, a lot of the experts that I talked to, civil liberties experts, technology experts, said all of these worries that people have about smart glasses and smart washes, tr being able to track your location, collect information from you, film things, we already have that with the cell phone. Now, in the book, you also mention various methods of repairing uh, sensory impairments. Right. Poor vision now. People have worn glasses for years. There's glaucoma surgery, you know, cataract surgery, things like that. But what are some of the new electronic developments to restore sight to people who don't have it. Yeah, this was one of my favorite chapters to research. So the chapter on vision is about one of the first people on the planet who's ever relearned how to see. It's a man who lives here in the Bay Area named Dean Lloyd, and he volunteered to be one of the first clinical testers of a retinal implant. So he was born with vision, but he lost it as an adult because he has a disease called retinitis pigmentosa. It's a disease that destroys the photoreceptors at the back of the eye. So he was essentially blind for 17 years. And then he volunteered to be part of the trial for this device called the Argus II, made by a California company called Second Sight. And he wears a set of glasses with a camera over the bridge of his nose. This camera translates images into these electronic impulses that are fed to a chip that's actually inside his eye. He had to have a surgery to put this inside his eye. That chip fires electrical impulses at his surviving photoreceptors at the back of his eye, and then that information is carried up to his brain along the normal visual pathway, the, along the optic nerve. Now, what he sees is not what he remembers from when he had sight before. He doesn't see shapes. He doesn't see three-dimensional objects. He doesn't see color that truly reflects what he's looking at. So for example, if he's looking at a tree, he doesn't see green. Instead, what he sees is these flashes of light that indicate contrast points between dark and light. So his world is a series of what he calls boundaries and borders, just flashes that tell him where things are. So for example, when we were walking by some buildings, he didn't see kind of the shape of the building. He saw the glint off the windows. And when he was looking at me one day, well, I'm mostly biologic material, that doesn't do much for him. But one day he said to me, your eyes are glowing. 
thought, what does that mean? And then we realized he was looking at my glasses, right? He was looking at my most reflective body part. So that's what vision is to Dean Lloyd. But it's a tremendously useful tool for him. He can use it to get around. He can use it to talk to people. He can use it to look at objects that are in front of him and figure out where things are. And he is very frank about saying, look, I'm just the Model T. This is just the first generation of this technology. It's going to get better. But his role is to say to the company, look, I can use this sparse information. My brain can translate these flashes of light into something meaningful for me, a real construction of vision. So is it that this camera does not send the entire picture because that's too much information to process, so it just abstracts it to the main points of contract contrast and lines. It's kind of like if you can imagine a, like one of those football scoreboards, um, but a football scoreboard that only has 52 lights on it, that's about what he gets, 52 pixel vision. And that's because the electrode that's actually in his eye is supposed to have 60 uh, electrodes on the array, but only 52 of them are working. So he basically has 52 firing points that give him information. Now there are other people working on other technologies that might create a higher resolution of vision, but that's where the technology is today. No, I understand that there's some stuff going on in hearing as well. Yeah. What's going on to augment hearing? Yeah, well, so it's really interesting, but the second site retinal implant was actually built literally on a cochlear implant, which is built to help people with hearing loss. And this has been around since the mid 80s. They actually took a cochlear implant and modified it to go inside the eye. So they're very related technologies. Um, one of the interesting things that was going on with hearing is not um, about augmenting it. It's about helping people who cannot communicate because they have Lou Gehrig's disease or they've had a stroke. Um, so they can't talk, but they can still form verbal uh, information in their minds. So it's like that little voice in your head, the, only one, the one that's always saying, did I leave the oven on, that sort of thing. We all have this thing that's called internal speech. And there are some people working at universities who are saying, could we translate that external speech? Can we get so good at reading that brain activity that we could build a device that would either speak aloud for a person who can't speak or would allow uh, them to drive a computer cursor on a screen so they could kind of type out what they mean to communicate to somebody else? Well, this was something very interesting in the book also where you could put a stimulus in the brain and observe the path of the electrical impulses yes and then create a model where you could do it in reverse, look at the path of impulses and recreate what the stimulus must have been. Right, right, so that's the idea is called stimulus reconstruction. And the idea is could we recreate what somebody saw or what somebody heard? And right now they're doing this primarily with test subjects who volunteer to lie in an fMRI scanner and basically have their brain activity read over long periods of time as they either look at images, they look at movie trailers sometimes, or they listen to things. The experiment that I sat in on, they were listening to podcasts. Mm -hmm. So they were lying in the scanner listening to podcasts. And the idea was to make a picture, to make a recording of what the brain activity was like as the person listened. So do you think this will ever get to the point that you'll be able to record your dreams? You know, there actually is a team that tried to test whether or not you could reconstruct a dream. This was a team from Japan that tried it. They, they had people get in the scanner and fall asleep and they kept waking them up and saying, what are you dreaming? What are you dreaming? And they found that they could kind of generally get at the kind of image a person had been dreaming about. So they would say, for example, we thought you were dreaming about a car and the person could verify yes or no. But it's not like they get a beautiful movie or, or image at, at this point with the technology. That said, some people I talked to said, wouldn't this be neat if you could use it, for example, to compose music? You just think the tune in your head and there it is. Or wouldn't it be neat if you could use this to drive a computer? You just think, oh, I can't remember the name of the painting I saw, but here's, here's what it looks like in my mind, and it would come up with an image of the Mona Lisa. Now that said, some people have said, okay, look, could this be really scary? What if the police could use it? What if you could be summoned to court to testify and they could force you to read your mind? Well, at this point, nothing like that exists. Um, the people who are part of these experiments are either lying for a long time in an fMRI scanner, which you have to consent to. There are certain people who've been undergoing brain surgeries who've volunteered to be part of these. Very few people are voluntarily going to have any kind of brain surgery. 
so that's a kind of a more theoretical use for it at this point. You also mentioned in the book something about the sense of smell because you refer to all the senses mm -hmm. and sometimes people have memory impairments as they get older. Maybe they have Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. But if they can smell things that they remember from their youth, that might trigger a whole flood of memories. Yeah. When we call this book, uh, we have the technology, but I don't only mean gadgets and electronics and, and computers, right? Technology is anything, to me, I think, anything that people have made to be useful. And one of those technologies is chemistry, right? Which is what the smell chapter is about. So most people might not know this. I didn't realize this myself when I started researching the book. But problems with smell are the first clinically diagnosable symptom of Alzheimer's, as well as Parkinson's disease. Um, and don't worry if your sense of smell isn't as great as it used to be. Everybody's sense of smell gets a little fuzzy over time. But with Alzheimer's, the problem is people can't differentiate very well between smells anymore. So I went to see a group in Paris in a hospital who work in the geriatric wing who are doing this really cool experiment to see if they can help people with Alzheimer's recall memories. And what they do is they bring in this selection of scents that they've made that are really kind of wonderful to, uh, to a person who's grown up in Paris. And they wave a paper wand under somebody's nose and they say, what do you remember, right? Does it help you recall memory? And all of us have had that experience in our life probably where you suddenly encounter something that reminds you of your childhood, somebody in your family, and it's very powerful, it's very nostalgic. And that's because your sense of smell is actually a very old sense and it's very closely wired to the parts of your brain that control for, for memory and emotion. Smell is enormously powerful. I'd love to ask you a whole lot more questions, but I think we're almost out of okay. time. It's really a fabulous topic, and I think a lot of work is being done, and we'll see a lot more interesting things in the future. Uh, it's time to wrap the show. I'm Marty Wasserman. I've been speaking with Cara Platoni, author of the new book, We Have the Technology, all about transforming sensory experiences. Visit our website, www.futuretalk.net. For Future Talk, I'm Marty Wasserman, and we'll see you next time.